Hey guys, Pop Daddy here. If you like it, subscribe it. Uh, so in this video, we are going to be touching base on why Lord of the Rings has become so popular. Now, of course, the fandom has come in all different shapes and sizes. There's been, you know, different panels at different cons. There's even been panels at Armageddon Expo, the smaller con in New Zealand. They've even made a Lord of the Rings themed convention. Uh, of course, there's been premieres, there's been cosplayers, uh, there's been people that, you know, have gone out and made their own short films, whether it be on Tolkien, whether it be on Lord of the Rings, whether it be on a subtopic to do with Middle Earth. Uh, so this video here, I'm going to be chatting to a, a few friends of mine and finding out exactly what it is about Lord of the Rings that makes them tick. Asher Pulse, and I am from the United States of America. Hey, I'm Tim. I'm from Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, hello, my name is Hannah and I'm from Auckland, but I live in Wellington. My name is Ryan Kappas. I am from uh, Minnesota. Is, uh, if you're not familiar, it is the little, uh, little snowy and sunny area of the middle of uh, North America. Hey, <laughs> just watching uh, Return of the King, of course, when the ring gets destroyed. So what got me hooked into Lord of the Rings? Well, it was the vast array of different species, different locations. It was something I had never seen in my life before. It was something I could relate to. And all in all, it was just a fantastic film, all three of them. Uh, so that's what got me hooked into Lord of the Rings. I've was first introduced to Lord of the Rings when I read The Hobbit when I was about 11 or 12 years old and I've been reading Lord of the Rings and the histories and everything ever since. I believe it was 2002. I had never heard of Lord of the Rings and I remember that my parents were going out of town and so they got gotten this couple to uh, babysit us while they were out of town for a few days. They brought a few movies along and Jesse says, Hey, have you guys ever heard of Lord of the Rings? And we're like, I don't think so. And he says, well, we've got two, the first two films. The third one's going to be coming out next year. Would you guys like to start watching them? Extended edition, the best way to watch. And he, so he pops in fellowship of the ring. And from the very first just that opening prologue i was instantly hooked and i remember going to the theater with on uh, christmas eve with my father and my uncle and i've never i never even heard of lord of the rings before this and you know i'm at this time i think eight or nine years old i time is flying by i remember just distinctly going to that movie and just being mesmerized with it it was incredible uh this film this world and i even remember like i was so ingrained with it that when it came to the end of the movie you know and sam and frodo are looking out over uh towards mordor um and then the credits roll i was i my heart actually broke right there i was like wait but there's still more uh, i actually remember watching the fellowship of the ring when i was about six years old in the movie theater and i really enjoyed it even at that young age and ever since then I kind of always was infatuated by the trilogy and I would watch it my weekends and I was just really into it. Now how many times have I seen Lord of the Rings? I'd probably say that I've seen the trilogy I know, between maybe 50 and 80 times. I know that when Fellowship of the Ring came out in 2001, I went and saw that at least 20 times in the cinema. Two Towers, at least 10. Return of the King, I've only seen that once on the big screen. Obviously, there's been times that, are, you know, you're at home and you're watching it, so you don't tend to watch the whole trilogy altogether. Uh, there was a time that I watched, I believe it was the Two Towers, and when I was working in the studio, I'd come home for lunch. And that would be my time to sit down, watch a little bit more, go back to work, come back the next day for lunch, you know, watch some more, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, I believe between 50 to 80 times altogether for the trilogy. Yeah, I know there's people that have watched it a lot more than me. 
in the first couple of years of the Lord of the Rings movies, I probably watched them 20 or 30 times. After that, I have no idea how many times I've seen them. I would probably say conservative, conservatively, uh, probably around 50 times uh, to see the trilogy. I'm sure it's more. Well, actually, I only just watched the extended version a few years ago. So I've only seen the extended versions twice. But I've seen the like the movie theatrical versions lots of times, like, I don't know, probably like a hundred times. If I had to take a, a, an estimate from since, well, wow, since about 2003, when I had all the trilogy together, I'd say I've, I've watched the complete trilogy of Lord of the Rings. And that's this is just Lord of the Rings, not even counting the Hobbits or the other animated films. I'd say I've watched the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings trilogy Probably over a hundred times. Extended or theatrical? It seems to be the question of the day. For me, it's always been the extended editions. Being a fan that I am, I always love the extra stuff. And if I can get more stuff on something I like, then, well, I'm not complaining. The last time I saw all three Lord of the Rings films in cinema it was a couple of years ago and they had it at the Embassy Theatre here in Wellington and they played the extended cuts so all three films uh, that was a good 12 to 13 hours in a cinema I think it depends if you're a fan of the trilogy or if you're not if you're just an average movie viewer and you're just watching it because you've never seen it before, then I'd probably suggest the theatrical shorter versions. However, I think the extended versions for myself are better because you actually see more about why characters do the things they do. You see like their backstory and their motivations. I love the extended editions. Uh, they're incredible, but I'm very busy. I don't watch them. It's four hours. And when I watch them, it's, you know, I usually fall asleep if it's too long. Because the theatrical were the, the way I originally watched them, that's the pace and the flow and the sound that it was for me. And that's how it is, is ingrained in my mind. I, mean, I think if you're watching it for the first time, it's not a bad idea to start with the theatrical version. That's how most people I found start out. But if you've seen the theatrical version and you really like it, you want more to the story, the extended edition, I think after you've gotten it introduced through the theatrical version, extended is probably the best way to go. So what does resonate with me about Lord of the Rings? Well, it's kind of set in a world where it could have happened. It's been made to the point where it's semi-believable. Uh, the characters you can relate with. And also I suppose the fact that how cool would it be to actually live in the Shire? One of the big reasons I'd say Lord of the Rings resonates with me on, on top of it just being uh, one of the most well-crafted and well-thought-out uh, series of films of all time goes back to something Tolkien himself wrote about and that is secondary belief. And he held that when someone's telling you a story that you know isn't true, but it's so well told and so thought out that you actually start to feel for the characters. Like when you're sitting down watching Lord of the Rings, you know what you're seeing. You know, it's, it's not real. It's fantasy. This was created by Tolkien. But at the same time, it feels so grounded and in so many ways connected to our own world that it feels... It feels real. The Lord of the Rings and Hobbit, the whole Middle Earth environment, I think re resonates really well with a lot of people because it's because it's reflective of um, real Earth histories and events and things that happened. And in some way, while it's separating itself from reality as a fantasy thing, there are still a lot of roots in reality and in our own histories. And so people relate to that really well. Stories themselves, I think, are just so incredible fantasy has always been a genre that i've just loved every aspect of it and, and one thing in particular about the peter jackson interpretation is how immersive it is every bit it doesn't look like a film set it you know, these feels real it feels like these characters actually exist and that really that realism of it really resonates with me so i was i've never really known why I like it so much. It was just something that I enjoyed watching and I 
really liked. But then as I got older and the more I discussed like with Pete and we had like breakdowns and actual analysis of the films and everything, it's kind of when I started thinking, okay, why am I attracted to the storyline and these characters? Because there's other fantasy films that I don't get into. So it's not the fact that I love fantasy. It's just I love this these movies in particular. I don't know. I think I really like the fact that there's so many different kinds of people in, in the film. Like there's different species of there's hobbits, elves, dwarves, all these other beings with all their differences. But then they all come together for the same goal and the same purpose. So another question a lot of people ask is who is your favourite character? Well, for me... My favourite character is a character that I resemble with quite well. This character is a hobbit. Most, if not all, including myself, would say he's the real hero of the story. He's a gardener, he's loyal, he loves his food, knows how to cook, and uh, one of his favourite foods is potatoes. It's none other than Samwise Gamgee. If, if I had to pick a character that was a favourite maybe Aragorn, if I had to pick one I identify with or something, I'd, I'd give you a different answer. Legolas <laughs> It's always been Legolas and it always will be Legolas it, it would have to be Gandalf, at least on the good side. So I'd say Sam Aragorn and Gandalf are my three favourites. If you have a favourite character you tend to have a favourite villain. For me my clues are this villain used to be a hobbit. Also this character you do feel sorry for this character also has something in his throat uh, this character pretty much is bald except for a few long strands of hair that's right he is on my t-shirt and one of the most amazing collectibles that i've ever seen that actually belongs to tim is right here i don't know i always found the nazgul really scary like i still do they're just really creepy you don't see any facial features they're just covered in a black cloak and they make creepy noises and everything so probably them because they're actually like legitimately scary <laughs> i'd say my favorite villain is probably saruman the white mainly because i think christopher lee is was by far one of the greatest actors to ever live the witch king if uh i have i've actually been cosplaying the witch king for a few years now and i'm kind of obsessed with him a little bit just love the look. I love the, the mystery behind him and the other uh, ring rates as well. A favorite villain in there? I think it, I don't know if you would call Smeagol a villain or not, because he's also a victim and that, that goes the same for a lot of them. Any of you as fanboys and fangirls would have had this on your wall. I surely did. Uh, so. <laughs> It's definitely plain to see that Lord of the Rings has definitely changed my life. You know, being a tour guide for Lord of the Rings was one of the coolest jobs ever. Got to geek out with all the other geeks and show them around my city. I mean, it was a fantastic job. I was born and raised in Christchurch. I saw Lord of the Rings and I always, since seeing the first one the first time, wanted to become an actor and a filmmaker. That's what gave me my career inspiration. Uh, cutting a long story short, I finally moved to Wellington, uh, second time now. I've been here for about five, six years, and the reason I moved is because of Lord of the Rings. I also studied Lord of the Rings for 15 years, ever since watching the first one. Ever since the films, I always said to myself, if I ever get married, I have to get married with the One Ring. Boys and girls, that is going to be happening. So yes, that is how Lord of the Rings changed my life. Well, I actually moved to Wellington because <laughs> because of Lord of the Rings. I know it sounds really nerdy. I always felt like an attraction to Wellington and part of that reason was because of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and yeah, I just met lots of people and people who were also interested in Lord of the Rings as well. And and I think also it's really cool like having a thing that you like. I identified as someone, as a fan of Lord of the Rings and I felt okay like going through like growing up and everything because there was something that I really liked that was like kind of different to what other people liked. Lord of the Rings, unlike other media, it's something that I can connect with others with on a more, um, I don't want to say like, like, like a higher plane, you know, that sounds a little arrogant, but unlike Star Wars where, I, you know, we can, you know, my friends and I, when we talk about Star Wars and Marvel and everything, we, we really, you know, it's a little bit more uh, chat. I don't want to say childish, but it's a little bit more of the chaotic talk. Where Lord of the Rings, we talk about the meanings behind things. We talk about 
why people did certain things and how it relates. There's actually, it feels like there's lessons to learn. They're not that there aren't in other media, but it's really prevalent in, in uh, Lord of the Rings. Now, as far as uh, the fa- film franchise, it's actually gotten me quite a few friends, uh, especially online. So it's definitely changed my way in that. So it's changed my life a lot more than I thought it would. It used to be just a, a series that I really love. It's become a, a big mainstay in my in my life. Uh, not only am I, I am, I'm a collector, I collect a lot of stuff from it, but I've kind of incorporated some elements of its, of, you know, Peter Jackson and Tolkien storytelling into some of my own projects, into my own writing, and even into my filmmaking for my senior film, uh, my senior capstone for my theater uh, minor last, last May. I film. I decided to do a uh, film based on the early life of J.R.R. Tolkien. The effect of, that Lord of the Rings has had on my life in general is, once again, a number of different ways. It's taught me to be more creative and express myself outside of normal terms. Lord of the Rings has affected me in the same way that I believe it affects a lot of people in that it's shown me that you can deal with real world situations in a fantasy setting and separate yourself out from the here and now and and that escapism can be a good thing and a creative thing. The original story the story, obviously, that influenced Peter Jackson's trilogy, The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Definitely, definitely my favourite book. Not much of a reader, so I've only managed to read it once. Um, if I was more of a reader, I'd read it more. I'm more a visual person, so that's why I've seen the, the movies quite a bit. First time I read this was 2003, just before Return of the King had come out. I was blown away. And like many, I suppose, when I read the stories, I was thinking about Peter Jackson's adaptation. So when they spoke about Aragorn, I think about Viggo Mortensen. They talk about Samwise, I think about Sean Astin. And that helped paint a real visual picture in my head for the trilogy. I wonder what other people's views are on the book, considering that there are a lot of film fans out there. I am a very big fan of the books. I've read it probably six or seven times it's just a wonderful wonderful series of books tolkien's writing is just so in-depth which some people might find off-putting some people would say he goes a little too in-depth tolkien goes in-depth about so so much of his his lore and his world but that's part of why i love it so much yeah uh i've read the 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 three uh the fellowship the uh, Two Towers in Return. I just finished reading The Hobbit again. I think I've read The Hobbit 18 to 20 times. It's really fun. And I can't wait to, if I have kids one day, God forbid, that I'm reading that to them because I love to act out the voices for them. Oh, definitely. I've got all of the books and I've been collecting them in hardcover. Um, not just the, the main books, but all of the histories and everything as well. Definitely a fan of the books. I have read the books um, when I was a teenager and I haven't read them the second time so I've kind of like been really I've always been interested in the films and loved watching the films but lately I've been watching a lot of YouTube like backstory about characters and backstory about regions and the purpose of Gandalf and why he's really in Middle Earth and all these like other things that I didn't really get from the films and it's making me want to read the books again because I've forgotten, like, everything. So if there's one thing about Lord of the Rings that I've been thinking about quite a lot lately, it's the Amazon TV series. Now what I know is obviously they're building it on the second age. Definitely something I'd love to be involved in. I've always said that if I'm going to be an extra on it, not interested, if I have at least a minimum of one or two lines, I would be very keen. Uh, But yes, I'm very, very much looking forward to seeing what they do with the Amazon project. Both excited and a little nervous for uh, what Amazon bring to the table you know i'm optimistic about it and the reason for that is i don't want to have that kind of cautious feeling in my heart about it it's a media that i love and exploring the second age which is so open who knows where it's going to go i'm nervous about that because i don't want them to ruin a good thing (laughs) i'm interested though because i know it's set in the second age it's going to have different characters and i think it's about the rise of sauron so we'll, like, it won't be exactly the same as Lord of the Rings, but yeah, I just really hope they don't um, you know, ruin a good thing. I haven't done a, 
a ton of research. I know they haven't released a ton of info. I believe they said it's being set in the second age. I don't know how much material they have to work on. I think they said they're kind of just basing it off the material and kind of creating a, a new story set in the in the time period, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I'd, I'd like to say I'm cautiously optimistic. I, I, I'd I like to see it. Uh, I will see it. I hope it's done well, and I hope they show Tolkien's work the respect it deserves. That's all I can really say about it right now. I'm really looking forward to it. There's a lot of speculation and very little information about it, but if you do have a look on IMDb, for example, you can see that some of the characters coming through give hints that they're doing the entire histories back from um, Silmarillion, which I think is a fantastic thing to do. I suppose you think that was terribly clever. Oh, come on, Gandalf. It was just a bit of fun. So my first memory of Lord of the Rings 2001, sitting in the cinema, I'd seen a trailer and I thought it looked like a fantastic movie. So here I am, I'm sitting there, as soon as it starts, I feel goosebumps, I feel all sorts of strange things going on. At the end of the movie, I said to myself, I need to be in that, I need to do that. Now I know a lot of people aren't fortunate enough like me to live here in very beautiful New Zealand. I live in a little city called Wellington. That is of course where Sir Peter Jackson lives and of course where the movie studios are. Now I've been to a few, fair few locations of course here in New Zealand. Not so much the South Island yet, we'll be getting to that. But I have definitely done the Wellington stuff and of course I've done uh, most of the North Island stuff. Uh, but of course there's a lot of people that don't live in New Zealand and it'd be interesting to hear what they think about coming over here and coming to explore Middle-earth. And of course there's my friend Hannah and Hannah's going to tell us a little bit about where she has been and what she's visited. I have not. I have always wanted to. I've, I've told myself, you find, you find a nice woman who also likes Lord of the Rings, New Zealand is honeymoon destination. We're going to the Shire. I have not been to New Zealand. It's something that uh, it's on my bucket list and I really, really want to go. Not just because of uh, the Lord of the Rings filming locations, but that's, you know, top of the list. I've been to Hobbiton. It's like one of my favorite days ever because actually seeing the sets. I know when they filmed Lord of the Rings the first time, they like demolished the set. So even though you could visit it, it wasn't, there wasn't really anything there to visit. Obviously, Rivendell. Mount Vic and seeing the Hobbit hideout. We had a workshop, obviously, in the tour behind the scenes. The Hutt River, Harcourt Park, where they had Isengard. It's like no wonder they filmed in New Zealand because we have such a vast variety of landscapes. So, I mean, they can film lots of many different scenes there, so, here, so. Am I a collector? Funny you ask. Yes. Do I collect everything that I want? Obviously not. Money can be an issue. However, I do have some pretty cool collectibles. I'm a collector of very, very, of a huge number of things, and a lot of those things are Middle Earth related. Yes, definitely. I definitely am a collector. Uh, it's a newer hobby of mine to be collecting. Um, within the past two years, it's kind of really were sparked. Going back to my dad a little bit, this kind of all spurred from back in about 2014. He bought me Orchris from United Cutlery. And that piece was sitting on my wall for, yeah, I mean, it was there for the longest time, but I didn't have any other pieces. And for whatever reason, I don't actually remember the exact reason why, but I was just like, you know what? I want to cosplay a Nazgul. I wouldn't say I'm a collector of Lord of the Rings things. I do have like posters. I have some of those little, the pop vinyl thingies. Not not a, a large collector. I, my collection's not as vast as some of the others, but I'm very proud of what I do have in my collection. So for, for one thing right here, I have behind me, I have my map of Middle Earth. I love keeping on my wall. Uh, first in my collection I'll show you is something I actually made myself out of materials I found at Hobby Lobby. 
I made the Arkenstone out of a glass gem paperweight, some just little plastic coins and some little glass gems. And I have a little LED light down there at the base that illuminates it. I'm very, I'm very proud of how this one came out. The other one I have is of course, the sword of Bilbo and Frodo Baggins Sting. But this is a very special one. This is a Master Replica's FX Sting. So looks like a normal sword, but then you slide the switch on and the blade glows blue. Mine, my own, my precious clip, clip. It came to me. So, how much have I spent on the collection that I have? Well, it's tough to say because I have had a few things handed to me. Uh, I've had pops for Christmas and my birthday. Uh, I've had mugs given to me for my birthday. I have, obviously, Saruman staff was given to me by an old tour guide. I've had the Elven Sword given to me. Uh, but I suppose with my studies for 15 years and, you know, everything in from 2001 to now, I'd say anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 New Zealand dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot compared to a lot of other collectors, uh, but looking at it, that is quite a bit on one franchise. Yeah. But of course, like I said, there are other people that have spent more than that. I wouldn't say like that much. Maybe if a tattoo counts, then maybe like $400. Well, if my girlfriend's going to watch this, um, I, they was all given to me by friends, and uh, I thank those friends <laughs> for their donations. <laughs> it, it's tough to say. If I don't include the armor, the armor itself, the, the Witch King armor and all that, that was about $2,200, all that. I, you know, the nice thing is working with people you become friends with, you can, and when you're, you can work on stuff yourself, you can bring that type of cost down. So that one's probably the most expensive by itself, the armor and the robes and everything. But overall, I'd probably say, including that, we're probably around the $7,000 to $8,000 mark. I don't want to think about how much I could have spent on Lord of the Rings over the years. I've probably got half a dozen different copies of the DVDs and Blu-rays and things like that, just because they've got different cases. I've got a, a whole heap of memorabilia here as well. The biggest collection of things and the most important collection of things I've got from Lord of the Rings or Hobbit are uh, the people that I met when I was actually uh, as an extra on The Hobbit and the, those friends um, have endured in that whole community of Lake Town. The Lake Town Extras has endured for the whole time from when we shot up till now. We still do a lot of things together and stuff like that. De definitely the friends are a dominant thing. So if we're talking just the things I've showed, I'd say probably around $600, $700. The books and the films that I also have, it's probably close to around, to around $800 altogether. Favorite collectible I hear you ask? Oh my goodness. I just have so many, from the One Ring, to Saruman Star, to the Elven Sword, to my Sting little letter opener. So many things have been given to me, I've bought many things. I, I can't say I have a favourite, I love them all. Nothing that comes to mind that's better than the other. It's all amazing stuff to me. I'll tell you what, it would have to be the, the model of Moria that I have assigned to me from several of the artists that made it and Alan Lee in particular. Probably my tattoo. I don't know if it's something you collect. It's the only tattoo I have and I don't know I keep forgetting it's there and then like one day I'll just go like this I'm like oh yeah <laughs> Lord of the Rings. My Lord of the Rings tattoo. Orcrist is definitely my number one because it was given to me by, by my dad so that has the, the sentimental value. As far as like as far as like just from an iconic piece goes I do find the piece that I t take off the wall and spin around quite a few times is actually the uh, High Elven Warrior Sword the Second Age. Noldorian uh, sword. I absolutely love that piece. It's one I've always wanted since a kid. And uh, my girlfriend got it for me last Christmas and I, it's just so fun to make. And I'm actually making a lightsaber version of it right now as well. It's clear to see that Lord of the Rings is still as big as ever. 
Will it die? No, it won't. Uh, of course, there's many, many, many fans out there. The Lord of the Rings trilogy is the most well put together trilogy of films I've ever seen in my life. It's it's just something that's that captured that creative spark inside of me as a kid, watching it and getting drawn in to the characters, to the beautiful effects that still hold up today, to Howard Shore's beautiful composition, going outside, playing with swords with my friends, pretending we were on the quest to destroy the ring, or on the quest to reclaim Erebor. Lord of the Rings, and even the Hobbit trilogy I'll throw in there, all these films really speak to me in a way that a lot of modern films really don't. No, I just want to say, um, especially for Tolkien in general, that I something I just find what is so appealing about this is how it is so connective for everyone. Everybody can find something in Tolkien. It's a story that, I, you know, there's a reason it's one of the best selling stories of all time, you know, short of the Bible, because it's it's so relatable, you know, the struggles that are in it. It's not just because it's fantasy, it's high fantasy. These tr the struggles are real in it that, that, you know, we can all kind of relate to it. And I think it's something that, you know, we can all talk about and we can learn a lot from Tolkien as well. Really hanging out for the Amazon series. Can't wait to see that. I think it's going to be brilliant. It's going to be different. They want to not conflict. They want to create a continuity between the, the series. So that's going to be fantastic. Really looking forward to that. My a message or something that I'd like to leave with is not Lord of the Rings specific. I guess if you're into something or you really like something, like don't be afraid to just actually like it. I'm Axel Scott. I am a Lord of the Rings fan. I'm Tim, and I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. My name is Ryan, and I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Hi, I'm Asher Pulse, and I am a Lord of the Rings fan. Hi, I'm Hannah, and I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. All right, guys, I've been Pop Daddy. If you like it, subscribe it. And next week, we have something exciting for you. We will have an interview with none other than Ian Brody, who wrote and photographed the photos for the Lord of the Rings location guidebook. So definitely subscribe so you don't miss that. Now just before we go guys, if there is a franchise that you are passionate about, that you really do enjoy, why don't you drop a comment below? You never know, I could pick you to do an interview, like the ones you've seen, and of course, talk about your fandom.